Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase. And joining me again is Dr. Rachel Gross, professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, uh, and a gear historian, outdoor gear historian. Um, thanks for joining me again. Happy to be here. Yeah, last time we talked a little bit about your work in general and um, just kind of what what brought you to this field of study, this area of study, um, and really how there's not many other people who are doing it. I don't know of anyone who's specializing in, in this area, um, but then we kind of talked to you know, like a high level overview of, of outdoor history. And, you know, you and I talked a little bit about back and forth of how would we break down topics moving forward. And, and you mentioned really outdoor clothing, like the influence of outdoor clothing on, on current styles and, and maybe that progression over time of outdoor style, uh, which I'm excited to, to talk more about with you today. Me too. Um, I, is, so maybe, you know, can we go back a little bit? You mentioned something in the previous episode that I thought was really interesting. And, and part of it was what attracted you to, to like clothing and gear and products in general is what they say about people. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about, you know, I guess why, why products and, and what is it that's interesting to you about pro products and, and maybe clothing in particular? Sure. So the point I bet I was probably making had to do with this idea that the things that we buy, that we wear, um, are kind of like a costume in some ways. They're, they're the way that we represent who we think we are or who we want to be to a broader world. I'm attracted to clothing as a way of exploring this idea of what are people's identities and how do they represent them, in part because uh, it's such a public way of displaying identity. Um, and it, f it feels like there's a wealth of documents. What I mean by that is uh, most people, most of the time, are wearing clothes. And so there are all these opportunities for historians to analyze, okay, what are they trying to say about themselves? Or what kinds of things do they represent about their uh, you know, gender or sexuality or other political identity without even realizing it by virtue of what they choose to put on their bodies? I like clothing because it's always kind of public display. Um, and I think that story gets especially interesting in the second half of the 20th century when clothes and what people wear, it's not just about uh, the style or the cut or the color, but also the brand names, which become visible for the first time, you know, on a chest pocket or on a sleeve or something like that. People start to have this yet, uh, yet another layer of meaning that they add to the clothes that they wear on an everyday basis. How, and so I think you kind of answered my question. I'm going to ask now in a way is how do you feel like clothing differentiates or is different from gear in that way? I mean, the outdoor industry gear and the clothing are, are so important. Um, you know, how, how did they differ? And, and you kind of answered that question already, but maybe some thoughts on maybe why clothing over, you know, talking about the gear, the gear is its whole own conversation. Sure. You know, they often are separate and the reason for that separateness gets, a, gets to the core of what I think happened when outdoor clothing became popular style. Essentially, what I mean is that often outdoor companies and avid outdoor recreationists see equipment as necessary tools. They're, they're a hardware, right? It's objects that you definitely need in order to stay safe, in order to survive. Um, they often have a more masculine tinge or reputation to them, at least in the marketing, that's often the case. Whereas clothing quite quickly, quickly can become not just an essential necessity, a, kind of a piece of equipment to help you survive, but also an emblem of a certain kind of lifestyle or an idea or an identity. And so it seems in some ways more frivolous, more feminine often is how it gets um, uh, tagged in the media. And it tells different kinds of stories, in other words. It can be used in other places. And so I think what counts as equipment and what counts as clothing is, can be a really fuzzy line, but how outdoor companies have defined that line over the last 50 years can tell us a lot about how they understand their market and how outdoor consumers see themselves. Right. I, I think almost a little bit of a sidebar, but I think of a company like Black Diamond Equipment it's, it's, equipment is in the name, but more recently they've they've moved towards producing outdoor clothing, 
and and part of that there's some business reasons behind that um and and you know some margins involved and uh, you know some business strategy um but but they they try to brand themselves as being an equipment company and they see clothing as an equi- as equipment right so it's interesting to see how brands kind of shake shake that out or or balance those two kind of categories but um what is it about outdoor clothing that that interests you so much and that progression over time uh so outdoor clothing and i think i could probably make the same kinds of claims about fitness wear sportswear in general um reflects this general trend in the 20th century of americans dressing more casually so at the start of the 20th century there was a very distinct kind of public clothing that was appropriate for going to work for going out on a city street and that was not things that you would wear if you were participating in some kind of field sport right they were quite different looks Uh, and that was an important uh way that society maintained boundaries between uh, who got to participate in public life, uh, what that looked like, what was good and respectable for a work environment. Over the last hundred years though, those lines have blurred a whole lot. And so outdoor clothing has showed up in more and more arenas far beyond the trail. That's why it's it's interested me, not just because it can tell us histories of outdoor recreation and who participates in outdoor sports, a story that I love, but also because there are so many fans of outdoor clothing who never set foot on the trail. And I think their story is important too, because clearly the messaging around what this clothing does, how it operates and what it represents has reached people's lives, even if they're not about to go hiking or climbing or skiing. Right. I think that's why, like you said, that's why this conversation is especially relevant right now is, is the athleisure movement. Right. And just the, just, all the outdoor clothing that's that's so available right now and and how it's really become accepted right for people to wear outdoor clothing you know when you're not climbing a mountain right um i think i think i I think that's part of what motivated some of this conversation right is just how you know how many people are using outdoor clothing on a daily basis um, and not necessarily for for performance Um, and that leads me into how would you define outdoor clothing right now? It's, it's kind of blurred, right? But traditionally, um, how, how would you define outdoor clothing? Outdoor clothing is usually, uh, something that was designed for, uh, sport. Uh, it has functionality, a certain ruggedness to it, but that's really about it in terms of definition. I think it can be both, um, outdoor inspired, or it can be some high performing, you know, functional outerwear that is necessary if you're going to be climbing up uh, a wall of ice in the middle of winter. So both of those things, I would say, hit the category of outdoor clothing. Um, And I don't actually think defining the line strictly is too useful in part because as you suggest, so much of, so many of the people who buy this stuff aren't yet necessarily using it for its intended purpose or what it was originally designed for. Right. I, and I think we'll get into some of this. I, one of the things that I, and correct me if I'm wrong or my, you know, my, my thought process is off here, but um, I think it's interesting as we look back and we'll, we'll go into some of this, but in the buckskin era, I, it, I imagine for most people, you know, or, or, or people like living on, on the frontier, right. Or living outdoors, like for the majority of, of the day, right. Outdoor clothing was probably the predominant thing that people wore. Right. And then kind of a movement towards living indoors and spending more time indoors and not necessarily needing clothing to perform. Right. And and now we've kind of moved back to everyone needing to wear outdoor clothing, but not necessarily to to stay alive or um, or for protection. So it, it, that kind of macro level progression of outdoor clothing and its use and its need um, is, is interesting to me um, over time. You, you have plenty more insights in, into that. But I think that that's interesting how people have used outdoor clothing just out of pure need, right? Like needed it to survive versus now we, we wear it because it makes us feel outdoorsy, right? We meaning me, right? Um, (laughs) But any thoughts on that kind of that progression over time, we'll get into the eras in particular, but any thoughts on that high level thought process? I I think that uh, your thinking is spot on there. I would call that buckskin era, uh, 
often the clothes in that era are, are workwear. So not necessarily what people of the 19th century would have called outdoor clothing because they weren't thinking about leisure, right? For them, sleeping outdoors wasn't about recreation, but perhaps necessity. And so clothes were just clothes and workwear was what they were wearing and using on an um, everyday basis. It's only um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, as more people are moving to urban areas and working indoors at desks, uh, as you suggest, that uh, workwear uh, becomes something distinct from what you would wear for outdoors, right? So indoor workwear, the formal attire, men's business suits, things like that, becomes something distinct from outdoor workwear that a, um, a logger or miner might need um, for their job. Oh, interesting. Um, maybe I've got so many questions, but maybe we can start back kind of at, at the beginning of your research. You know, and if you could remind your listeners, where does the beginning of your, your research and study start? I guess what, sure. what time period? Skin era, as you referred, yeah, the buckskin era, as you referred to it, is the time period after the Civil War. So the second half of the 19th century, when Americans for the first time began to pursue activities outdoors as a part of leisure or recreation. So camping or climbing up mountains were things that they were choosing to do for fun during vacation times rather than things that they needed to do out of necessity. Uh, so the story starts um, in an era before there were companies dedicated to making clothing and equipment for these outdoor recreationists. And it takes off basically at a time when outdoor companies started to form in recognition of this new set of consumers who wanted to go outdoors and wanted to equip themselves well to do it. Right. What, what insights do you gather from that time? You know, we kind of started at the top of the conversation, um, outdoor clothing, you know, influence or as a, as popular style. Is there any, what are some of the key insights that you gather from that time, the buckskin era, as it relates to now, what, what influence can we feel from that era? And maybe that's, that's an interesting way to, to, to divide up each era and, and kind of tease out what are those things that, that we feel from, from that era? Uh, well, one, I would say that uh, outdoor clothing, so what people were wearing for their hunting and fishing trips, what they were wearing to climb up mountains, um, could often be old clothes. So it wasn't specialized attire in any way. It was simply things that were too worn for day-to-day -day life in the city. Uh, the other thing uh, that I think is important to mention is the way that even in the 19th century, Americans recognized that wearing outdoor clothes was a kind of costume. Many people looked to Theodore Roosevelt uh, and his books that he published on his hunting excursions in the United States and around the world, and they looked particularly at the costumes that he wore. So he had a buckskin suit uh, that he posed in for one photograph um, for a tale about uh, a hunting trip in the American West. And for many aspiring outdoorsmen, this buckskin scoot became, suit became a kind of icon of what it means to be and to look like an authentic outdoorsman. So many people are using old clothes that they already had in their trunks or closets, but others are looking to uh, new publications, guidebooks, travelogues like Te Theodore Roosevelt's to get an indication of here's what it means to look like an outdoorsman. So I guess prior to this, were, were people, where would people find their influence for outdoor clothing, right? I, I mean, you, there's no large brands. There's, there's not the Patagonias or, you know, the brands that you have this identifiable symbol, right, that you wear on your chest. Uh, where were people, you, you suggest, or you mentioned that people are looking towards people like Roosevelt um, to some of these early guidebooks to, to learn, like, what should I be wearing? Um, is that accurate to say? Is Rather than brands, it was individuals like that or, or publications? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, we could go back even further and ask, where did these outdoorsmen who published about their experiences and made recommendations to others get their ideas? And often that came from experience and also individual relationships with wilderness guides of different kinds. So in the 1860s, there was an, uh, a Civil War soldier who then wrote a guidebook about being outdoors and um, hunting and fishing trips. Um, there were outdoor guides published that made reference to 
Native Americans who had served them as wilderness guides in the decades prior. And so, in other words, there's always often one layer of expertise that we're getting as the readers of the publications um, that comes from the author. And the authors, in turn, had to learn from somebody. But you're absolutely right in suggesting that in the 19th century, where people are learning from, where they're getting the information, is not companies, right? There's no corporate branding involved in the outdoor guidebooks recommendations about how to sleep under the stars. So what are, what, what are people, I guess, from, from your research, are, are people seeing, you, you mentioned that some people see it as a, as a type of costume, even in that time period, what, what were some of, the, some of the motivations besides necessity, right, um, for certain activities? What, what were people thinking about themselves when they would wear something? Were, were they saying something about themselves consciously? Did they want to say something about themselves by wearing a certain piece, even in that time period, even if it wasn't a brand? Um, what, what were they saying about themselves? Sure, sure. They absolutely did want to say things about themselves. One of my favorite uh, types of anecdotes comes from uh, the Eastern young man who recognizes himself to be a greenhorn, a total beginner when it comes to the ways of the woods, who heads west, buys a buckskin suit, and then is immediately recognized as an outsider and as an imposter because the coat that he's wearing is, has too many fringes or doesn't look dirty or worn enough. So in other words, these Eastern men who were eager to uh, kind of become what they saw as the embodiment of Western white masculinity would put on these clothes in order to become that person it didn't always work because it was easy to recognize who had new or store-bought clothes rather than uh, handmade buckskin attire, for instance. But those stories do represent the notion that, yes, even in 1890, people knew that they were dressing up to say something about themselves, to be a certain kind of person. That's not so different from right now. Right. I mean, there's uh, even, you know, we, we wear things to say, oh, I'm an outdoorsy person. Like I, I, I like the outdoors, even if I don't climb mountains. Right. It's, it's not so different from, from today. I mean, from that story that you're, you're sharing. Uh, you know, I think it's actually quite similar. And, and that's a fun thing about doing histories of people and their leisure habits is you can see a lot of parallels. I think it's important to note that in both eras in ours and in the late 19th century, uh, not all people were always acting self-consciously to say, here's who I am to the world. In other words, it is possible always to wear a hat with a logo and not be thinking every minute that you have that hat on, here's what it says about me and my community and where I come from and what I stand for. It does say those things, but it would be exhausting to think about your clothes that much um, in that kind of in-depth way. And so we have to kind of take these stories of the greenhorn and buckskin worrying that he's not, you know, looking manly enough in his new attire uh, in a broader context, which is to say uh, they also have other reasons for going west. They have the family context they're leaving behind, the new town that they're coming into. All of those things are an important part of the story, not just the clothes, but the clothes in that era and today can help us understand the broader kind of world and who this person is. Right. What what are some of the other macro level influences that we're having on the the types of clothing that people were wearing at that time? You mentioned individuals like like Roosevelt portraying this this image, right? Of I wear this because I'm a masculine outdoorsman, right? Um, you know, portraying that image. Um, you know, there, there's also the war. You know, civil war um, at that time. What 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 are some of the other influences that you feel like had you know people moving west? Any other significant influences that you feel should be mentioned around what, you know, what types of clothing people were choosing to wear at that time? Sure, absolutely. Um, those are all important ones. I think another big one is the shift from uh, people making their own clothes or getting their clothes custom made by a tailor to buying ready to wear clothing off a store shelf or from a store catalog. So what that shift looks like is rather than having my own family or a neighbor perhaps sew the things that I need for a day-to-day -day basis both for work and for more formal occasions I might have by the 1890s um, ordered clothing from a uh, Montgomery Ward catalog or a Sears Roebuck catalog. Those kinds of shifts are indications of obviously 
uh, broader movements towards industrialization um, in the United States um, and the fact that people could uh, afford to buy mass produce goods like underwear or socks or eventually shirts and pants and dresses as well. By the early 20th century, we can start to see a major shift in how Americans acquire clothes, how much those clothes cost as a percentage of their overall household budgets, and then in turn, how many things they can fit in, the, in their closets. So um, whereas in the late 19th century, people wore old suits to go hiking simply because that's what they own. There was no specialized attire unless you were kind of a Teddy Roosevelt eccentric like buckskin, you know, acquiring buckskin. There was no specialized attire to climb up a mountain necessarily. Um, by the first few decades of the 20th century, people could afford to buy clothes for work, clothes for formal occasions, and clothes for leisure time activities that included outdoor recreation. Do, and so that's, uh, I guess, where does that second era, I guess in, in, in these terms that kind of the eras that we're talking about, when does that second era start? Is that when clothing becomes more available through stores and, and catalogs? Is, is that kind of where you'd put that line? Um, I would, and, and there's not one single date or year I can give yeah. you. Historians generally talk about the rise of mass consumer culture uh, between the 1890s and the 1920s. And we mean a few different things by that. We mean, of course, the availability of goods, like cheap clothing that you can order from Montgomery Ward, um, but also the fact that that clothing is available all around the nation, not just in particular stores in particular cities, and also that there are national advertising campaigns and systems to reach all sorts of different markets. So the rise of leisure clothing in Americans' closets by the 1920s is supported by that broader shift in how companies reach new markets, how they access them, how they mail the goods or put them in different kinds of stores. Yeah, so in this, I guess the second era, we'll, we'll call it for our purposes, right? How was outdoor activity perceived at that time, right? It's probably less of a necessity for people, right? It was more of a, a luxury or it was becoming a luxury or I guess, how did people perceive or, or connect with the outdoors during that time? The outdoors was hugely important at the turn of the 20th century. Um, there uh, were campaigns coming out of the railroad industry and then later the auto industry related to uh, getting Americans out to see their newly founded national parks. See America First was a tagline of one of those earlier uh, campaigns, which essentially suggested that Americans had the kind of civic responsibility to not head to Europe to see um, the ancient ruins, but rather to get to know the American heritage by visiting the wonders, especially of the American West and its national parks. So outdoor recreation was nationally important. The industry that founded around uh, kind of this trend towards uh, accessing outdoor spaces uh, was not just the railroad industry and later the car industry, but also a growing set of clothing and equipment companies. Sometimes these were companies that had originally sold workwear. So a good example is the uh, Portland, Oregon based company Hirsch Weiss, uh, which sold workers clothing at the turn of the 20th century over the next 20 years. Uh, they recognized that there was a market not just for people who needed rugged clothing for outdoor work, but also hunters and fishermen who needed similar kinds of clothing, but for their leisure time activities. So outdoor recreation and its growing industry was an important part of um, the kind of national story about what makes people an American, right? Visiting a national park, recognizing the grandeur of those wilderness landscapes, um, became an important part of that story. What was motivating a lot of that? You mentioned the railroad, so some commercial interest in in getting people out um, and, and and seeing these places. Certainly, um, what what were some of the other influences at that time um, to to get people outside? Uh, well, since I, I'm writing a story about industry, uh, obviously, I I often do look for those commercial interests. But I think um, there's also a cultural one as well. Uh, mm. I mentioned that um, in many ways, the pitch to the ordinary American was you can become American by seeing these places. So in many ways, the outdoors was about the formation of national identity. 
Um, the shift in transportation modes, which just means more people owning cars, really influenced the rise of outdoor recreation. So, you know, whereas at the turn of the 20th century, there were no cars within a few years, there were a few thousand trickling through, there were tens of thousands and then many more coming to the most famous national parks in the West in the decades that followed. That also allowed for um, families uh, who were middle class to access national parks in a way that hadn't been possible before. In the railroad era, right, when people could mostly either wear their old suits or, uh, as was more likely for the most elite customers, get a tailor to custom make uh, their buckskin suit or the equivalent for um, a woman, uh, those people uh, had the vacation time to go for months at a time on grand tours of the American West. In the car era of the early 20th century, people could go on a camping trip for a shorter amount of time um, and still kind of enjoy some of the same sites. So um, to come back to your question, one of the broader things going on in the early 20th century was shifts in um, the national economy and access to vacation time, right? That means change in how work operates, which means you get weekends um, that allowed middle-class Americans to take these kinds of vacations. Right, right. Um, I, I guess, can you dive into that a little bit more? What was, what was work looking like for people during that time that, that started to allow for vacation time? And um, I, I guess, what was, how was work changing uh, over the, you know, kind of that period of these two eras? Sure, I think the, one of the most important things uh, about shifts in work has to do with the success of unions at advocating for uh, shorter work weeks and better conditions for the people who were there, as well as a certain kind of stability or predictability to wages. Um, that allowed for, for instance, somebody who was working in a car manufacturing facility to know, yes, there would be vacation, you know, a predictable two weeks a year, um, which seems miserly if we're looking in the European context, but for American workers a hundred years ago, did sound pretty good. Um, and that there would be some money available um, to take a trip uh, somewhere other than the city that you live in for a few weeks. Well, and those, those are impacts that I mean, directly, we can feel those impacts today, right? The, the leisure time that we see now can be traced back to, to that period of time. Is that accurate to say? Absolutely. Um, how you mentioned some of this, um, kind of this rising, you know, you know, you're an American, if you go and appreciate the outdoors, right. I appreciate our, you know, national beauty here. How much of that is tied to kind of nationalism awesome. globally, um, and, and world war one, how much of it is tied, tied to that? The campaigns uh, about seeing America first predate uh, the First World War. Hmm. Um, but there's no question that uh, um, any study of like people and their national identity um, should also be kind of linked to understandings of uh, immigrants in the United States and attitudes about whiteness in particular. Um, when the National Park Service released uh, uh, a well-known booklet on America's playgrounds to try and convince people uh, in political office that they should support uh, the national parks by creating the park service in 1916. The idea uh, was that these parks should be a playground for current Americans and for the future. Who counted as American in that vision was quite narrow, right? It was um, white Americans and it was in particular um, those coming from Northern and Western Europe. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, but immigrants from Southern Europe, as well as from other places around the world, um, weren't considered white. So a good example of that in the historical literature is that Jews, Italians, people from Ireland, all of those categories weren't counted as white according to these standards, made up standards of uh, American uh, national identity at the turn of the 20th century. That meant that the parks for America, America's playground, really weren't for all people, but rather for a distinct set of them. But the story of uh, accessing outdoor recreation in the 20th century really is one of democratization. That doesn't mean that by the end of the century, all people of all stripes could go camping easily or had the means to do so. 
but it does suggest a general trend of expanding who is able to participate in these kinds of activities and who has the means to do so. So the cars help with that, but so does an expanding notion of who counts as an American. That opens up a whole nother conversation that could be really interesting to dive into. I, you know, I hadn't even considered, you know, obviously I, I see like the outdoor industry does have a diversity issue. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's been widely talked about in, in recent outdoor retailer shows is how do we increase participation across the board? Uh, so much of that lack of participation from from certain groups or communities, I imagine you can trace back to, to some of these events. It's, again, this could be a whole nother podcast that I would love to, to talk about. But is, is that safe to say that some of that can be traced back to to some of those perceptions and actions and um, from from the time period we're talking about? Uh, yeah, I do think it would be worthy of a further conversation. In general, yes. Like any time we're trying to examine uh, how did this outdoor sport get so white, it makes sense to look at the long historical roots of the demographics and participation and the role of uh, corporations in shaping who was able to participate as well as the role of state and federal governments in dictating who could have access to particular kinds of leisure space. So yeah, there's always a longer history to tell in, in any, with any one of those questions. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that, that would be really fascinating to dive into. I'm going to make a note. That's, that's one that we'll have to touch on for sure in a future conversation. Um, so I guess any, anything in particular, I, I, I could, you know, point out a couple things, but anything in particular from this era that, that, you feel like, you know, outdoor style was influenced by, I guess, modern outdoor style? I, I guess I can answer that by saying what outdoor clothing was not in this era, which is uh, fashionable or widely visible. So hmm. even though I said this was a story of the democratization of the outdoors, particularly as automobiles made uh, natural spaces more accessible to the middle class, um, that doesn't mean that people who were wearing their newly purchased specialized outdoor equipment and attire um, could wear those in everyday life. So a good example of that is I read an account of uh, uh, a woman and her family who went camping in the 1920s in, uh, in California, in the, near the Bay Area. And her son later recalled in a diary that um, his mother would get tanned from camping. She'd have her special camping suit that she often wore um, for these trips, and that she would always rush into the house to make sure that her neighbors never saw her camping clothes at the end of a trip. So she wanted her family to participate in these activities. She thought it was good for the family, that it was reflective of the kind of values she and her family shared. And yet, it still made sense to hide this specialized outdoor sporting attire from the people who saw her in a more urban context. It was embarrassing, essentially, to wear camping clothes walking from her car to her house. Obviously, when we look at the later 20th century, there's a dramatic shift in how people perceive this kind of specialized sporting attire. So I think the most important thing to remember from this early 20th century period about outdoor clothing and popular style is that it, it really wasn't. It, it wasn't popular style. In fact, it was kind of a, a, a niche look for a particular set of activities and nothing more than that. It's so interesting to to think about that and and reflect on, I mean, the, just the the status that comes with wearing a certain outdoor brand now, right? It's completely opposite effect um, or or impact or influence. Um, what how would you classify or or call the, this era? Uh, hmm. I think that I've often looked at the period before World War II as one big shift towards the rise of mass consumer culture. So even you know, from the buckskin time period, Teddy Roosevelt and his ilk, all the way through the era where um, you know, the, the mother who goes camping is uh, eager to shed her camping attire, all reflects kind of the nascent outdoor industry um, where people still need to be convinced that uh, um, what goes off, what goes on, on a camp, you know, on the trail or on a camping trip is somehow related to their lives in the city. So 
what I call this period, um, so from the Civil War to 1939, in other words, is um, the era when the Blaze Trail crosses the boulevard. I didn't come up with that really nice turn of phrase. That's actually a Abercrombie and Fitch uh, uh, tagline that showed up on their catalogs in the early 20th century. What that suggests, though, is an era when um, the boulevard, so the everyday workings of commercial life in urban America, crossed with what happens on the Blaze Trail out there in the wild, right? That commerce and nature were coming together. That's a good representation of this entire era. Right. And it seems like Abercrombie is the company that kind of embodies that. So it's interesting that they came up with that, that tagline, right? They're, they're really embodying that whole idea at this time. Is that right? Um, they are. You know, they outfitted people like Teddy Roosevelt for hunting and camping trips. Um, and uh, they also uh, established a headquarters uh, in Manhattan. So uh, basically by saying we are an outdoor outfitter, but centrally located um, kind of at the nexus of commerce in the United States, making a claim for the fact that uh, outdoor activities, right? Uh, pursuing nature was worthwhile and culturally important and deserved to be in this central location. It's interesting, just that, the, the thought of that, I, I think about how that relates to today, where you have companies like Patagonia or, or in Utah, having a company like Backcountry, primarily an e-commerce business, selling outdoor products, but they have their own line. They open a pop-up shop in New York, right? Um, it's, it's interesting, kind of a, a callback to that, um, to that, that idea of, oh, well, we're outdoor, but we're also in the city. Um, and that idea kind of persists. And I think the outdoor companies, especially right now, are kind of leaning into that idea even more and, uh, and partially to expand their customer base, right? And we, we can get into that as well, but kind of an interesting parallel that we're seeing some of that with some of these companies that are trying to reach customers in the cities. Um, that was happening with Abercrombie back back then, which is interesting. Yeah, they also, I think they were the originators of this notion of creating an outdoor experience indoors in the middle of the city. They called it kind of the green respite from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. And that's a really similar model in some ways as to what I see with outdoor stores now um, that are kind of, you know, 100,000 square foot or more of uh, mega stores complete with uh, museum style exhibits and waterfalls and aquariums, right? Like outdoor stores can be experiences of nature to the modern American. Abercrombie and Fitch was also the originator of that idea. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. Um, how, how does uh, World War I influence? Uh, right. And you mentioned kind of the next era starting with World War II. How does World War I affect um, people's perceptions or um, how does it influence outdoor clothing at that time? If, uh, if at all. Oh, it absolutely does. Um, I think a good way to trace it is looking at um, the uniforms of World War I and the stylist, stylistic after effects in outdoor clothing. So if you look at uh, military uniforms during that war, uh, you'll see uh, what are essentially uh, riding pants. So uh, pants that are tight up until the knee, they're kind of baggy and loose from the knee until the waist. Uh, that was part of what the the military look was during this time. And in the 1920s, most photographs I see of both men and women outdoors emulate that very style. This is in part because some American outdoor people buy surplus military goods, including clothing, including riding pants, um, but also because uh, companies that are producing outdoor clothing are taking stylistic nods from the war era. I know that. It, we, we typically talk about World War II where, you know, veterans come home, a lot of them gaining mountain experience, you know, or, or outdoor experience, uh, working with gear is, you know, and that be, having an impact on, on participation in the outdoor industry. Is there a similar effect with World War I with, with veterans coming or soldiers coming back, having experiences that they, they bring back and that influences outdoor culture and, and people participating in the outdoor industry? Uh, you know, I don't think so, or at least I haven't read any stories to that effect, which makes me realize I don't think I've asked similar kinds of questions because I've assumed there wasn't that story. Um, that has to do in part, I think, with the patterns of American participation in World War I and when they jo joined and where they fought. 
but also it means maybe I should think a little bit more about that question. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, we talked last time, 10th Mountain Division is is well known for coming back and, and having ski experience and mountaineering experience and that being essential to, you know, many of the ski resorts being founded after the war. Um, you mentioned the the Quartermaster Corps and, and the influence of that and the surplus of gear coming back. Um, I, 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 I just kind of thought about that as we were talking. It's like, did World War One have that same effect? So it might be interesting. You know, I, I'm going to dig into that myself. Because um, I imagine some of these people learned skills that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have had when they were out you know, had they not been in the war, you know, and coming back, they probably gained some, some kinds of skills that maybe they didn't have before or experience with products. I think that's, so the instinct is spot on. Certainly historians tell similar kinds of story for stories for the civil war era, hmm. that it's both the experience of living out outdoors in harsh conditions, but also kind of the homosocial, which just means, you know, like all male bonding experience of being with similarly aged young men, uh, sharing these activities that help stimulate interest for outdoor recreation in the decades that followed. So we do see that influence um, post Civil War and the um, kind of the spur of uh, people now interested in outdoor recreation in part because they wanted to relive but more safely their wartime experiences. Um, I would imagine there are similar trends um, for World War One. Do and do, does the fact that that in the military in both World War One, World War Two, predominantly you know fought by by men, does that like perpetuate or um, like solidify this idea you know around that time that the outdoors is a masculine activity? Do, do the wars kind of entrench that idea as well? Uh, I'm not sure if I would put wars at the center of this kind of notion that the outdoors is a primarily male activity. There's no question that if we're looking at the the material stuff of war, so namely, what is the surplus goods, you know, what are the surplus goods that come out of it, that because they're mostly made for men's bodies, that that does shape who's able to wear them or at least wear them comfortably in the years that follow. But I think you know the notion that the outdoors is a male space and particularly a white male proving ground goes back far earlier than any one of those wars, and I think it goes deeper even than World War in terms of being entrenched in narratives about what it means to be an American. Seems like a lot of that can can kind of be traced back to to Roosevelt, as we mentioned earlier, and and maybe er earlier than that. Uh, I mean, the notion Roosevelt built on the idea yeah. that was already entrenched that there was an American frontier where men could go to, you know, test their metal, uh, which means that that idea, uh, right, that wild place just beyond the edges of civilization um, goes back uh, even further. Right. Again, another, a whole other podcast conversation that would be really interesting. Um, so I guess kind of this World War II era, uh, do you mind sharing what are some of the direct influences that, that come from, from that time period? We alluded to some of the activities and some of the knowledge that maybe was gained that was brought back, um, you, know, in, you know, in terms of, you know, learning expertise or getting expertise in skiing and mountaineering and that, the influence that that had. Um, what influences did clothing have at that time um, in, in this kind of wartime era? Sure. I can tell one story that shows how the war influenced style in the outdoors and beyond in the years afterwards. I mentioned in our last conversation that many outdoor equipment manufacturers, owners of outdoor companies, served as consultants to the Quartermaster Corps during the war. During the war. One, one such person, person was Harold Hirsch, who um, had inherited the um, Hirschweiss or White Stag Company from his father, um, a few years earlier. He served as a consultant to the Quartermaster Corps, going to Washington, D.C. to give advice on particularly design of tents, but also on other um, clothing, uniforms, uh, and he would bring those ideas back with him to his Portland manufacturing facilities. So what that means is that as the military is redesigning its uniforms for cold weather, we can see those same designs trickling back to places like Hirsch's Portland factory. So that the jacket that he and his company White Stag sell 
which has a, you know, like a reference to the military origins in its very name, is actually quite similar to the one that the military um, starts to issue to soldiers in the years that follow. So that means that because of the role that these outdoor equipment um, you know, innovators had serving the military, but also continuing um, to run their businesses, we can look at not just the effects of the military in terms of surplus or in terms of teaching outdoor skills, but in these very kind of narrow areas of design. How baggy should a cotton jacket be? Where should the ties for that jacket be? How tightly should the waist cinch? All of those kinds of questions, which the military had to answer before they were able to say, here are the specifications for producing this jacket on a mass scale, were also ones that influenced how Hirsch and people like him designed their clothes in the years that followed. It seems like there's, there's such a strong focus on function, performance. Well, maybe not as much performance. Maybe performance comes later, but at least there's there's thought going into you know what are the conditions that i'm going to be facing using this equipment um you know i I keep going back to you know the the mountaineering skiing example and and how that influenced someone like jerry cunningham coming back and and you know having you know fought in the war with 10th mountain division um you know realizing the deficiencies of the gear that he was using there and using that as influence to come back and and improve upon products and, and being put into harsh conditions um, is, I guess, it, is function kind of the key thing that comes out of, of this experience? I would say that the idea of function is central to how both the military and then later outdoor equipment uh, and clothing designers think. But it can often be a kind of signal of something else too. Function and tracing how people talk about it is important in part because they're also suggesting at the same time that following fashion or style is a problem, right? That it undermines Mm. how well something works. And often these questions go hand in hand. The military knew that because military officers knew that it didn't matter how well a jacket functioned in theory, how well it worked to keep the wind off of a soldier's back, for instance, If the soldier refused to wear it because he didn't like the way it looked or because he didn't think it functioned. So in other words, even during the war itself, we can trace the design of jackets to debates about what looks good between different generals in the US military. Style, which in part means acceptance, a willingness to wear this, and because my general thinks that it looks fit and sharp on my body, Um, is an important part of the function of jackets because it means that people will use them in the way that they're intended. So for years afterwards, we often see uh, kind of invocations of military clothing and then later outdoor clothing more generally as functional, as functionally focused, as mostly about how they're going to perform. I think that's partly true, but it's also a sign that whoever is saying that is trying to underplay the fact that these things are becoming, if not stylish, to the point where they're on a fashion runway, at least knowingly recognizable styles to people in an insider group who care about what it looks like to be an outdoor expert. Those people do care about how it looks. They're not just thinking about performance, but they often suggest that they're only thinking about function as a way of kind of waving their hands and saying all that other stuff doesn't matter. Right. That's interesting. I, I think that's, everyone has a different definition of function, right? And, and something that is, I guess, designed to be purely functional can also be fashionable, right? Or the fashion can be a part of the function. And I, I've run into so many people who have a different definition of that. And I, I liked yours. Um, did when, when a lot of this material clothing became more available to the general public, those who weren't, you know, soldiers coming back, veterans, did people buy it because it was more genuinely available or because they also thought it was fashionable or they liked how it looked or that's always a decision making factor right like it, it people have to to enjoy how it looks but were people buying some of this or acquiring some of this surplus product because it was available or because they liked it or a combination i think it was a combination uh, probably the most important thing about surplus was that it was nationally available and it was very cheap right you could get uh things for a few cents or a few dollars not the uh, you know, 30 or $40 that it might've cost to manufacture that item originally. Um, so 
those were important considerations. It's also important to note that wearing military surplus in the 1950s didn't have the negative connotation or at least the political intonation that it came to later acquire during the anti-war protest era um, in the 1960s and 1970s. So in other words, wearing army surplus was about perhaps aligning yourself with victory culture in the United States, right? And being looking American, um, it wasn't a negative commentary on the role of the mili US military being involved in uh, foreign wars. Yeah, I, I think I kind of, I jumped ahead of myself too, just surplus, like, and I, I love what you said there. How, can we dive into that too? Like the surplus and do you have some insights there of like how that really started and, you know, just this availability of gear? Is there, are there any insights there of how significant that was to have all these products available to people at that time? Yeah, it's, there are statistics. I don't, have them all off the top of my head, but I can tell you um, that whereas there had been in the early 20th century a handful of specialty outdoor outfitters, Abercrombie and Fitch and its associated stores is a good example. There were a few of these stores in large cities in the United States. There were a few specialized um, outdoor stores um, in places like uh, Seattle um, or Boulder, but for the most part, having access to specialty outdoor clothing and equipment was not a given for most people who thought about participating in outdoor sports. They made do with what they had. They bought from national mail order catalogs like Sears, um, or they sewed or built whatever they needed. That's what they had access to. Army surplus changed all of that. The military resold uh, goods that had been used, lightly or perhaps not at all to veterans and then other people who wanted to start small businesses and these veterans opened army navy stores in small towns all over the united states so then it wasn't just new york city and seattle where you had um outdoor clothing and equipment you could also buy very fine down sleeping bags from a small store um on the or even not a store, from a, from a tent on the side of a road where a veteran had just shut, set up shop to get rid of this massive amount of, amounts of sleeping bags that he had just acquired. So in that sense, army surplus availability radically shifted people's ideas about what you could take on a camping trip with you or on a hunting or fishing trip because suddenly there was cheap outdoor clothing and equipment that was available, that was accessible to them um, and so packing lists began to shift in response to the availability of goods. So the number of stores uh, that sold this kind of equipment radically increased as the military kept unleashing more and more of these cheap goods um, into uh, the auction houses. So both of those things meant that, yes, the ordinary American who had an interest in the outdoors could suddenly access this regardless of where they lived and they could probably afford some part of the equipment even if they wouldn't have been able to in the decades prior. So leading up to this, I mean, people were buying gear either from catalogs or from a regional store, but not every region, you know, or city or town had access to, to a store and, and not everyone, you know, received those catalogs, right? So this dramatically just made kind of democratized gear for people during that time. Right. And it's important to note that we shouldn't look at uh, who buys outdoor gear in a vacuum. Just like the early 20th century, um, you know, increasing prosperity nationwide, uh, boom in American manufacturing during the war and afterwards, all influenced the amount of money that people had to spend on fun, but ultimately unnecessary, you know, for survival, recreational goods, um, the ones that you would take on a camping trip. Right. And that kind of goes back to, again, like, this shift in like outdoor gear be, being a necessity, right? And outdoor clothing being something that you need for survival to something that you need to per perform a certain task for survival, um, you know, or work to it's, it's something for leisure. Is this kind of the, the tipping point for that? I, I guess, it, you know, it's hard to put any line in the sand, but do you think that's where this really starts to shift? Um, I would say that, uh, Using outdoor clothing and equipment for leisure happens, that shift happens starting much earlier in the 20th okay. century. But what's important about the post-World War II period is the boom in 
participation, right? More right. people than ever are going outdoors for leisure. And that means there's going to be a comparative boom in the outdoor industry as more companies start to cater to these interested outdoors people. So where does that lead us next kind of post-war era? Um, how would you classify that, that time period and, and how does the war lead um, and that post-war era, how does that lead into this, this next phase, this next so, time period? Yeah, the outdoor uh, years and the aftermath of, uh, sorry, the, the outdoor war, World War II, and its aftermath certainly had an influence on uh, outdoor clothing becoming uh, more widespread, on people being able to access the newly designed equipment, but also being kind of influenced by the ideas that they represent. Layering is a really good example of that that we talked about a bit last time. Um, for the most part, though, I would say I, I group both the wartime and then the two decades that follow all together, in part because some really interesting outdoor companies start in the 1950s and early 1960s, but they were able to start, to start directly because of wartime influences. So in other words, the army surplus boom of the immediate post-war created the capital and the kind of product base that allowed many people to get into the outdoor industry for the first time. And so Jerry Cunningham, who you mentioned, was able to start Jerry Outdoor Sports because of the war. Similarly, his competitor in Boulder, Leroy and Alice Hollybar, also started selling army surplus before they got into more specialized mountaineering equipment. So I group the years after the war in with that wartime period because the direct influences are so clear. The turning point for me is around the late 1960s when outdoor clothing starts showing up on college campuses, when people going to class who don't really need hiking boots or puffy down vests start to wear them because they think it looks good, and when there's another boom in participation in outdoor sports. As baby boomers come into their late teen and early 20s years, they start taking more and longer trips to wilderness areas, participate in a wider range of outdoor sports, and we see a boom in the number of outdoor companies that form to cater to this new demographic. Wow. What, um, what, what other key influences, you know, as we're kind of entering this, this, you know, these couple decades, what are, what are the main influences um, in, in the post-war era? Um, you know, you mentioned the baby boomers, um, kind of the w wealth created after the war, people like Jerry, um, Roy and Alice, um, that expertise um, and knowledge of product. Um, what, what, what other cultural shifts were happening at that, that time? So um, a few things can help us understand the boom in participants and the boom in outdoor companies around 1970. Um, one is the rise of new kinds of education classes. So think places like um, Knowles, right, where you learn how to, how to have certain kinds of wilderness skills, um, outdoor education classes on college campuses, the rise of outdoor clubs all help with the creation of a new population of young people who learn ethics of the outdoor, it matters, as a part of their ongoing education. Another important part of this shift is new magazines um, that uh, get formed around the 19, 1970 to cater to this population, as well as the publication of many more guidebooks than there had been even in the early 20th century. So if you look on the shelves of you know, a used bookstore today, you can still find a whole bunch of outdoor guidebooks from the late 60s and early 70s that represent this era of new publications trying to bring more people into the outdoor world. To go along with that, we also have the rise of popular environmentalism. So that means that there are more young people thinking about uh, what is this environment out there and how do my actions as an individual and as a participant in a community influence um, those spaces. So all of those things together help to bring about this shift uh, towards uh, participating in outdoor sports. Um, I think another important one to mention is the rise of uh, new attitudes towards fitness. So uh, new, approach, new ideas about what a fit body looks like means that people are eager to be active and engaging with um, new kinds of strenuous activities and outdoor sports really fit the bill.
right? Where, where were some of those ideas coming from those influences about, about body and, and, you know, body image? Uh, one good place uh, to find them is in uh, federal government studies on the health of the American nation and what can be done to change that. So um, there was lots of concern, for instance, in the 1950s about uh, American men and adult men and their heart health. The response to that was physical education programs that taught young people how to be active and taught them certain ideas about what nutrition should be, what kinds of physical activities they should be engaging in. By the 1970s, though, we're talking about um, uh, a new trend, which is the rise of running, right, or jogging. Um, uh, that was kind of a, a new focus on cardio exercise that, had, that was distinct from earlier areas of fitness provoked, promoted by the federal government. Um, backpacking and climbing and mountaineering, kayaking, I mean, there's a whole lot of this cross-country skiing fall into that category of activities um, that match up with some of the new standards or ideas about physical fitness. What is it about, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what is it about this era d- that you think kind of just became this, um, I, I, this, this perfect space for brands to be cultivated? I, I feel like this is when we really start to see recognizable brands that people associate with a certain kind of status, right? I mean, Nike born out of this, you know, the growing running movement, right. And this time and, um, you know, Patagonia, um, you know, around that time as well. Um, it, I guess what, what is it about this time and, and maybe what are some of those brands, um, that kind of grow out of this time? And then maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about the importance of brand, um, after that. Uh, sure. So the, what is it about this era? I think that, um, paying attention to where logos show up, help us understand the rise of brand. There's no single reason I can give you as to why people value having a swoosh on their pocket in a way that they didn't 10 years earlier. Um, But I don't think that attributing this shift to the genius of marketers alone makes sense. People are looking for new ways to identify themselves as individuals and identify themselves to other members of their groups, of their communities. And so brands turn out to be a really useful way of signaling membership in a small group. Um, They often uh, kind of cultivate this image of being uh, like set apart or niche or being a part of a group of the cognoscenti or the people who are in the know more than everyone else. Um, Companies welcome that kind of association often. Um, companies that have done that successfully or brands that have uh, kind of used that attitude um, include Patagonia, as you mentioned, Holly Bar is another good example of this, a company that's no longer around, but that successfully helped create an identity group and a community in one particular place in Boulder around the experience of shopping at that store. Part of that had to do with the charismatic leader of the company. Her name was Alice Holly Bar. And people often associated her, right, her way of being, her expertise about not just gear, but about mountaineering and climbing in general with the company itself. And so to wear a jacket or a sleeping bag that had that company's logo signified a kind of personal relationship with this expert owner. Um, The next step, of course, is to say, well, if I have a personal relationship, I also must be an expert too. And I think that's a big part of what people are trying to say when they wear these brands is performing a certain level of uh, expertise. You have companies like Eddie Bauer and LL Bean that are much older, right? Than, than a Patagonia or, or, or Holy Bar. Um, Did, did people have that same idea when they were buying an Eddie Bauer product? Did they, did they make that association of, Oh, well, I have their name on me. So that means that I know, what I'm doing in the outdoors or, or did that come with, with the whole you bars and, and, and those companies later on? Uh, I think it had the same association um, in part because Bauer and Bean share with Holly bar that same kind of origin story, which is the expert outdoors person who goes on to make gear and clothing for their peer group first and then, and then sells to others. Um, but I think the shift here is 
in the broader American culture. So in other words, we don't see um, expert mountaineers in the 1950s eager to wear a Bauer branded puffy jacket on the top of a mountain in the Himalayas because it's the Bauer brand, right? They're interested in how does it work? Will it keep them warm enough? And can they trust this company? Of course, there is no logo on the outside of jackets in the 1950s or even in the 1960s. By the 1970s, the interest in how people as consumers want to represent their identity and the interest in companies and getting their brands out there coincide. And so at that stage, people who wear Eddie Bauer jackets, just like they do with these other newer companies, are starting to say, yes, this signals something about my expertise, and I want to be aligned with that character, who is, of course, a real person, Eddie Bauer, the man, or L.L. Bean, the man. Um, and they're able to do that because the company continues to tell stories about the origins and the heritage of the company that help support those claims. Right. Oh, that's interesting. We're and kind of building on this idea of brands. Um, does that just continue to mature as we kind of enter, I guess, after this era, there's one more that you've kind of defined, right? Um, and, and brands really start maturing during this time as well. What What is this next era that we, we kind of enter into? It's kind of the, I guess, the one that we're in now, right? Yeah, I think um, the... Looking at L.L. Bean and Eddie Bauer can help us understand the era of the outdoor lifestyle. So uh, in the 1980s, people in the United States spent more and more money on outdoor equipment, but especially outdoor clothing that included from brands like L.L. Bean and Eddie Bauer, the two biggest catalog based retailers in the country for um, outdoor sporting goods during that time period. The reason was not because they were spending more hours outdoors. That number had actually uh, started to stagnate by the middle of the 1970s. So that boom that I had talked about was over by the middle of the 1970s. The purchasing, however, continued. And that was because of the rise of this idea of outdoor lifestyle, which is essentially uh, an affinity for the ideas that being in tune with nature, participating in outdoor sports, and getting all the stuff that goes with it represents something positive and good and important about a person's identity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the person actually participates in the sports. So outdoor lifestyle uh, doesn't mean you have to do the sport as long as you like the idea of it and what it represents. Outdoor companies are balancing a very fine line between the functionality of equipment for the sport it was originally intended and people who want to access those goods because they are stylish, uh, because they represent something about who they want to be or how they want to represent themselves to the world. Right. Um, so I, I feel like that just really embodies kind of where we're at right now and uh, where brands are, are the direction that they're moving. Um, and, and, and I think part of it, there's, there's some real positives from that. Um, brands seemingly trying to make, make uh, the outdoor industry more available to more people, I think, and, and expanding the definition of what is the outdoors. You don't necessarily have to go necessarily to see the the parks. You can be in New York City and and go to Central Park, right? Or or just participate in indoor activities. Um, you're seeing a lot more of that, I, I imagine, as well. And and again, part of that is, I imagine, for most of these brands, just trying to expand their um, their reach and reach more people. Um, and and in some ways, you've probably got plenty of insights on this as well, like the, just brands seeing fewer people doing the extreme activities maybe, um, and that need for equipment, um, and it, maybe the opportunity to, to, to grow into to clothing, because um, there's just much more of a need. It's something that you wear every day, right? Um, I guess, what other insights do you feel like and maybe looking back across the eras that we've talked about and that there's so much more that we could dive into. Um, it, this was, you know, we've, we kind of covered all the areas really quickly. Um, I guess looking back over all the eras, wh what are the big things that you notice um, that have influenced the clothing that you see daily? Maybe not as much anymore considering our, our circumstances right now. <laughs> That's right. Endless, I don't see but, anybody daily yeah. really. Um, uh, <laughs> 
I guess what what do you see daily and and when you see a piece of of outdoor clothing, you know, what are the things that stick out to you that you see as callbacks to to the past mm-hmm. and some of these past influences? Mm-hmm. Um, so we could talk about this in terms of design, but I actually want to touch on something that you suggested, which is that the vast majority of people who buy outdoor clothing are not buying it for any kind of extreme activity. And I want to bring this up because it might seem like a a complaint or even a suggestion that things used to be better in the past, more rugged, more authentic, at least kind of purer iterations of the meaning of the brands and where they come from. I don't think that's really the case. Uh, I do think looking at the hand wringing that happened at outdoor companies in the 1980s and 1990s about what to do about this big market shift um, is a really important thing. So trying to make sense of why or what does it mean now that everybody who walks by my door is wearing some kind of outdoor brand? I, I'm in Denver, so that's probably not surprising to too many people. Um, we have to go back uh, 30 years and look at the debates happening within outdoor companies as the market started to shift. So. L.L. Bean and Eddie Bauer uh, recognized that they were selling to people who like to wear these clothes to walk their dogs and not to climb up mountains. But at first, they tried to hide that association. They, they, when they won fashion awards, company exec- executives would say fashion is really a problem and we're pushing back against that um, reputation because it gets in the way of what our brand is. By the 1990s, as outdoor clothing spreads far beyond the imaginations of the, you know, the executives at Bean and Bauer and other uh, comparable companies, um, we see a new kind of expansion of, okay, here's what this clo- these clothing choices might mean beyond what corporations intended for them. One example of that is the brief trend of outdoor clothing being popular in hip hop fashions in the 1990s, right? North Face puffy jackets, Timberland boots, um, both outdoor or workwear brands were quite popular with young black men and brown men in um, cities like New York and Detroit and Chicago. There was a lot of hand wringing about this undermines the authenticity of who we are. We don't want to actually market to this set of people because it's going to draw us away from what our core market is. In the end, company executives came around to it because they could make money from it, just like they could from most of these other trends, the preppy trend of the 1980s, you know, the the era we're in now. And I think all of these things suggest that consumers are going to do mostly what they want, right? Companies can control some parts of the messages. They decide what the advertisements look like and who the models are and what values they're trying to affiliate themselves with. But once these products are out in the world, they do take on lives of their own. They're not divorced from our, con- our social context. So it, pay- it matters to pay attention to who gets to define, who participates in outdoor sports, what does whiteness look like, and who embodies, you know, uh, who counts as white. At the same time, none of these stories of outdoor clothing becoming style are predictable, right? I mentioned earlier, there was that story of somebody trying to hide their clothes as they rushed into the house. Another person wrote in a newspaper article that it would be unthinkable to see a stag cruiser, a kind of uh, hunting jacket on the streets of Manhattan. Unthinkable because it would be so inappropriate and out of place. And outdoor companies didn't have genius marketers who made that shift. It was people who decided these things had value beyond their uses, who helped bring outdoor jackets to the streets of Manhattan. Um, And so I think consumers are really the ones to pay attention to here because the people get to decide what happens next with these companies. I I think that really bookends the conversation really well is we kind of started by talking about like, what is it about outdoor clothing and clothing in general that's interesting? And kind of, kind of how what you just said there. It's 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 the individual who gets to decide like what that clothing means to them and says about them. Um, I, I think it's also interesting just this era kind of being defined by not being predictable, right? And people choosing to be unique and letting you know defining what their clothing says about them. Um, with that said, 
I would, can I ask you to predict the future, right? In an era that's unpredictable, where do you see, you know, based on your insights, where do you see things going as it relates to, to how people feel about their clothing in particular outdoor clothing? Yeah, historians don't love that question, uh, but I'll see what I can give you. Um, I think when I started this project a decade ago, um, one of the most common styles that I saw on college campuses was brightly colored and boldly patterned outdoor clothing and backpacks and boots and things like that. 10 years later, what's far more common to see on a college campus is a workwear brand or something that's made not out of synthetics, but out of natural fibers. And it shows up in tan and green and brown rather than magenta. That's fine. I, wherever it goes, you know, in terms of fashions, I think it's interesting, but it, that by itself doesn't tell us much. What we can see from that shift, though, is that um, the trends are going to continue to evolve in ways that I can't predict even, predict even knowing this long history. One thing that is consistent is the return to styles of previous eras. Most historians of fashions will tell you about, you know, the nods that we can see um, in this era back to previous decades. Uh, and outdoor clothing styles are no different. That's, so one of the trends we can expect then is to see outdoor companies continuing to use historical research from their own archives, right, from their own materials, their old catalogs, their old designing um, guides to shape what designs of the future will look like, which means we're kind of in a circle in some ways because it's the styles of the past, which even if those styles are only from the 1980s, have this reputation of being more authentic or more rugged or better and so seemingly more attractive. So I think that's one thing we can always see is the way that history comes around. I think that's a pretty good prediction. And I, I feel like the appropriate prediction for a historian to predict that we will be <laughs> reflecting on our history and using our history to influence our future. So I think that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, any last thoughts that you have as kind of we wrap this up? I, I think we could dive into each era, you know, specifically and, and talk more about each one. But I think that was so valuable to to look at the macro and, and touch on each era. And, um, you know, I, I've gained an appreciation for each era and, and have been able to trace back, you know, um, you know, these influences. So I thought this was really helpful. But any parting thoughts that you have um, just just kind of on on the influence of of these different time periods on, on current styles and outdoor clothing in general? Uh, I think I would encourage uh, listeners to go uh, into their closets and take a look at the range of things that they have there. Um, I would anticipate for many people, they're going to find not just outdoor brands, but the influences of sportswear more generally. And by that, I don't mean Nike or Adidas, but rather the um, sportswear of college campuses from 100 years ago, things like sweaters, right, have now penetrated everyday office styles. And so in that sense, um, what we've talked about probably is reflected in the closets of people who are listening to this conversation. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a moral weight to it, right? It's not good or bad that your clothes look the way they do, that the collection of things you have in your closet are what they are but rather it is an opportunity to tell stories about them or to realize that what you think you're wearing on an everyday basis, because that's just what people who go to offices wear, actually has a much longer history and that your closet is a part of that. That's great. I'm going to go look at mine here in a, <laughs> here in a little bit. I think that's great advice. Um, well, thank you as always um, for taking the time for all your work and research. Well, again, we'll link to... Um, to all the work that, that you've done and how people can connect with you. Um, but again, thanks, thanks for sharing your insights. Um, it's, it's incredible to reflect back on, on, uh, on this history. So thank you again. Thanks, Chase.